So selection is a relatively new term, and I want to spend a, a minute talking about it and its implications. I first ran into it um, in a paper by John Donahoe, who is one of the textbook authors. Um, he wrote a paper in the 90s called Selectionism and Essentialism um, in Behavioral Science or something like that. And uh, it was an interesting piece, and, uh, and that's the first time I saw the word. So the word is relatively new. But uh, it's defined as an explanation of complex outcomes as the cumulative effect of the three-component process identified by Darwin. And the implication of this is that it, it's expanding our understanding of evolution to new circumstances or new situations. And the definition that it's an explanation of complex outcomes um, can mean a lot of different things. We know that from Darwin's day that uh, trait selection in the selection of particular traits in an individual, your hair color, your eye color, the, the length of your femur, whether your earlobes are attached, your nose hair, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff was, is what we're talking, that's what we mean by traits. Um, we know that those are selected um, um, by uh, this process, but then um, the implication became that maybe we can view our behavior in the, in the lifetime of an organism or the lifetime of us is being selected by uh, certain things as well. Or maybe the mechanism of our behavioral change is a selective mechanism. Um, that was first raised um, many years ago, codified, I think, best by a 1980 paper by B.F. Skinner called Selection by Consequences, in which he argues that uh, reinforcers select certain patterns of behavior. Um, explicitly, and he said it was it, it, the same form that Darwin was talking about, he, but this was selection in the lifetime of an organism. He even implicated, and Richard Dawkins did as well, Richard Dawkins in a 1970s, mid-1970s book called The Selfish Gene, um, re, it, it introduces a term called a meme. Now, you guys all know memes from the internet, from Facebook, and, and so on and so forth. But that, that term comes from an evolutionary biologist, uh, the famous guy, if you follow any biology uh, uh, things, you'll know him. He's still alive today and still writing, still very active. Richard Dawkins um, invented the word meme, and that was, um, uh, it was defined as a piece of sort of cultural or social behavior that got selected by a community because that community or that society or that group of people um, persisted or existed longer. It provided an advantage over them. So selectionism is identific identification of a, of a causal process that is applicable to multiple levels, traits, behavior, and even social norms or social customs. Um, it's an interesting idea. And uh, one that's gaining a lot of uh, gaining a lot of traction. So if we talk about trait selection, though, that's what you guys we're going to be coming back to behavioral selection and maybe social selection in later uh, uh, chapters. But when we talk about uh, selection of traits, so let's say we wanted to select we wanted a short, stout dog because we are, for example, we we have cattle, we have cows that we eat for meat, and cows kick dogs. And that puts dogs at risk. So what we want is we want a dog that can help us work the cattle, but it's got to be low to the ground so that he doesn't get kicked as often. But he's got to be pretty strong so that he can, he can work the cattle. So what we do is we select short, stout dogs over successive generations. What, what that means is that means that we only allow short, shorter and stouter dogs to have babies with one another. And this process was known in Darwin's day. Uh, livestock like beef cattle and dairy cattle, hogs and chickens and cats and dogs, all sorts of, of things have been artificially selected. <coughs> Excuse me. It was even used by slave owners in the early United States. Um, and that is that if you take the biggest, strongest slaves and put them together and have them make babies, what you get is you get uh, children that are bigger and stronger. And this is... Um, in fact, the case. But to use our dog example, what we do is we start with um, we start with a mama and a, and, a, and a mother and a father dog, and then they have some offspring. And what we do is we take the offspring with the, the most desired characteristics or close to the desired characteristics, and we only let them have babies 
with um, a dog, maybe with the characteristics that we want. And what we see is we select um, we select four certain uh, uh, traits. In this case, a short and stout dog. So. Um, all the dogs that we see, all the variety of dogs that we see around the world are the same species. They're Canis familiaris. Um, they, they, they come from wolves, Canis lupus. Um, and uh, they, uh, a pug and a bulldog and a, and a husky all are the same species. And the variety of those uh, traits that we see, or the variety of dog breeds that we see, is a result of artificial selection. Now natural selection is when instead of a person or a group of people or um, some agent selecting uh, for particular properties, what happens is nature or the environment or a niche selects for certain properties. So we know that traits vary from individual to individual. Everybody has different hair, different eye color, different, uh, you know, except for twins. And some of those traits provide advantage over others. So, for example, if you live near the equator and you have fair skin, you're likely to get sunburn and probably sick, and you're not going to have more babies. But if you have darker skin, you can maybe uh, take advantage of that, uh, meaning that uh, you, you're, you're more likely not to get sunburn, not to get sick, and you'll have more babies. Now, if you live closer to the Arctic Circle, um, skin color... Uh, light skin color may provide you advantages over dark skin color because you can hide from the saber-toothed tiger or something like that. So the environment will select for certain traits to become more and more numerous over successive generations. And the peppered moth is a perfect example of this that we've even seen in the lifetime of usually natural selection works pretty slowly. Um, it, takes, it takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations. But what we saw in England in the mid-1800s was evolution occur almost right in front of our face. And that is that uh, we, the, these two are peppered moths. They're the same uh, animal, but one, there's variation between them. Some are peppered and some are black. And uh, in, in, early Eng in the early 1800s in England, most of the peppered moths that were flying around were of this kind. They were the peppered kind. They were they were white with these black spots on them. They, it was like they they had dropped uh, black pepper on them, right? But then there was a few, um, you know, maybe one or two in a hundred that were all black. And uh, what it turns out is this is a camouflage. This is a way for an, uh, this animal to hide in uh, woodland areas during the day, and and it sleeps during the day on a birch tree like this and it's very difficult to see so it's safe from predators but this animal that lives on the birch tree was not safe from animals uh, a, a predator like a bird would come by and eat it so they the selection mechanism here was that was the camouflage that the color hides from predators and these guys that survived were much more likely to have babies than these guys because these guys were getting eaten so what we see is that more lighter dark miles are, are born. So we see variation, selection, and retention, the three components of Darwin. Now the environmental demands or the niche is what works on our selection process here. And when, the, uh, when we saw the Industrial Revolution, what we see is the trees start to get soot covered because of the coal plants around uh, the countryside in, in England during the Industrial Revolution. So now the selection mechanism has sort of changed, or the environment has changed, such that these peppered moths are now easier to see on the darkened trees, whereas the dark moths are, are, are difficult to see. So who gets eaten more? Well, the peppered moth, the white moth, now gets eaten more. And now what we see is we see many, many more dark moths. And now that uh, England has uh, restricted pollution and changed some of their environmental practices, a lot of the trees are going back to... The, this white birch uh, pattern, and now what we see is more of the white peppered moths rather than the black peppered moths. So we can see evolution almost within um, lifetime, our own lifetime uh, of an organism. So evolution involves three processes, or three components, we call them, variation, selection, and retention. Variation is just that individuals differ from one another. They have different traits. We have different hair color, different eye shape, different ear lobes, different nose hair, different femur lengths. And, um, and those result from individual differences, differences. They can also 
evolve from mutations, genetic errors, or, or problems in, the, in crossing over, or, or meiosis, or something like that. Now, some of these traits lead to certain advantages or disadvantages in reproduction. Being tall or being short, being uh, having blue eyes or brown eyes, or fair skin or light skin might provide an advantage. And our genes contain the recipe for those, and that's how we retain them. So the three-component process of evolution is variation, selection, and retention. We need all three of these for this to work. Hopefully that helps with, with uh, selection and selectionism and natural selection and evolution. And uh, we'll be moving on to some other topics from here.